Hello, and welcome to AAMFT's 2021 At Home Series. My name is Sylvia Kaminsky, and I am the President-Elect of AAMFT's Board of Directors. When we started this series in May of 2020, it was still early in a period of time unlike any that we had experienced. We faced professional challenges, yet we quickly adapted to providing services by telehealth and virtual training, following precautions and adjusting to regulations to keep us, our clients, our students, and our colleagues safe. We face personal hardships, yet we made a difference in our communities and served those in need, speaking up for those experiencing systemic injustices. We faced isolation, yet we still connected and supported one another, connecting as we were able and strengthening our professional bonds in a way that is sure to have lasting impact on each of us. In short, our profession rose up and met these challenges, providing mental health services that were needed more than ever. As we gather for our second at-home series, we have much to be proud of what we've accomplished throughout this last year. The at-home series is not the only place you can hear from innovative and pioneering systemic thinkers. The AMFT podcast features unique interviews with pioneers of family therapy and some of the biggest names from our professional world, sharing their origin stories and firsthand accounts of their work in the field. The podcast also features engaging conversations with experts who provide information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession, exploring topics that relationship-based therapists care about. From students to experienced clinicians, there is something for everyone in these conversations. Episodes are available twice monthly wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're not already a listener, there are over 50 episodes to catch up on. Another resource comes from our very own speaker today, Mauricio Andolfi, who is part of the documentary, Breaking the Fence, Learning from the Giants, in which he shares his views on the development of systemic theories and family therapy through the lens of his 50 years of working and teaching in this field all over the world. He outlines the revolutionary ideas and clinical achievements of some of the greatest innovators of this field. Using their humanity and creativity, these masters show therapists how to break the fence, searching for authenticity, strengths and resilience inside families, as well as in institutional systems. Filmed in his apartment in Roma, Rome, Dr. Andolfi shares intimate anecdotes and recollections of his personal and professional experience with some giants of family therapy, including Carl Whitaker, Salvador Minuchin, Mara Salvini Palasoli, and James Framo. These master therapists come alive through precious and unique video material of their lectures and family therapy work, inspiring the next generation to follow their footsteps. This video series is available on Tenio, AMFT's online learning platform. Courses are available on demand and can be found at aamft.org learning. If you are interested in receiving continuing education credits for this session, please consult the reminder email you received this morning to find information on completing your session, evaluation, and downloading your CE certificate, as well as the check-in code, which will also be posted into the chat. Today's session is being sponsored by CPH and Associates. As the endorsed professional liability insurance provider for AAMFT members, CPH and Associates is proud to sponsor the AAMFT at home series. CPH provides portable occurrence form coverage that protects you throughout your professional career. During this time of evolving practices, CPH is pleased to assure you that their policy covers telehealth services, as long as such services are permitted under your state's law. A policy with CPH provides peace of mind so you can focus on your career. Get policy highlights and an instant quote online at www.cphins.com. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to today's presenter, Mauricio Andolfi. Italian family therapist, Dr. Andolfi, initially trained as a child psychiatrist and lived in New York City in the early 1970s where he worked extensively in the South Bronx and later in South Philadelphia with disadvantaged families of different ethnic groups. Dr. Andolfi is professor of psychology at the University of Rome, the director of the Academy of Family Psychotherapy, 
and editor-in-chief of the Italian Family Therapy Journal. In 1999, he was the recipient of the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapies Award for significant contribution to marriage and family therapy. He was the co-founder of the European Family Therapy Association and past president of the Italian Therapy Society. He has published widely in both Italian and English. Benvenuto, Dr. Andolfi. Okay, <clears throat> nice to meet everybody. There is only one thing I not mentioned in my, in my curricula, in the, my presentation, that I've been living in Australia in the last uh, nine years, more or less, commuting from Australia to Euro, to US, but unfortunately not during the spirit of pandemic. And now, the subject is very intriguing today. It's about intergenerational couple therapy. And I would like to start with some historical perspective. First of all, at the beginning, we didn't have a specialized branch called couple therapy. Everything was part of this frame. There was look at family problems, either the problem were coming from children, adolescents, or from the couple themselves. I think in a way was a, an error of the movement of family therapy to arrive to this distinction between couple therapy and family therapy. And I would like to explain why. Of course, when you have a couple in crisis, you want to deal with these issues. You want to help the couple to get out of their problems. But when you do couple therapy, generally then you forget about other components that are very important, like family of origin, extended family, uh, kids, the children of the couple, even the social part of the people's life, like the system of friends or neighbors. So I, I've been trained thinking that everything has to be looked as part of the family dilemma. And they've been in the field for over 50 years, see couples as well as families. Now, I never will see a couple in solitude. What does it mean? I would never do a treatment with the couple, see these two people always together, nobody else dealing with their communication, with their complication, with their conflict, etc., etc. So I would like to enlarge the picture. From where I learn about these ideas, mostly from Jim Fremo. Jim Fremo was a fantastic person. Probably was not regarded as much as he deserved. And Jim Fremo was the one who introduced intergenerational family therapy. And this idea was to prepare special meetings with the family of origin of each partner. He will do separately. See once a partner with his or her own family of origin, and they will meet back the two of them. The impact of even one, only one session with the family of origin was tremendous, was incredible. Why there? Because what we call couple conflict or couple crisis, not always has to do only with the couple themselves. Often there are a lot of pressures that come from upstairs. Unfinished business with family of origin. I've been seeing now a couple here in Australia, and many other, Miss culture, Italian, Australian, uh, Australian, uh, even though there is no such a thing as an Australian family, but a family who has been living through generations here in this country. And you know, sometimes there are some incredible loyalties of adult son or adult children of the family that they feel they have the duty and the loyalty to always please their family of origin, their old mothers, and sometimes this kind of loyalty toward the older generation become a disloyal toward the marriage, and sometimes even with the children, because they feel neglected. 
So it's almost like you have a third party in the, in the bedroom, in the intimacy of this couple, which is mother or father, one of the two. So this for me was a very interesting research in work with couple to invite physically family of origin for a special meeting that we call a consultation, in which of course the parents were not supposed to come and join the session with the couple who judge them or to be judged. At the opposite, we invite family of origin in order to give them the sense of bringing resources, which means talk about their child when he was really a child and now he's an adult, he's married with his own or children. So the, that was the beginning of my idea to reincorporate the family in work with couples. Then there is another aspect who I think was for me extremely important to include children as well. Now, often other people say, even professionals or couples themselves, we are in crisis, we have a lot of dilemmas, we don't trust each other, our children don't see, don't hear, are not involved in our problem, which is difficult to believe. Children feel smell, uh, hear everything. So instead of protecting children, taking them out from the picture, the idea was why I don't use the children as a resource. So invite the children for special meetings. Do you know when a couple is in crisis, the voice of a child becomes more relevant, is more heard than the voice of the partner. So children can bring in a lot of ideas, a lot of positive aspect, because even if they are in crisis, they both love their children. So children are like a free conflict area in which they can really start to work differently. Now, sometimes it's impossible to invite family of origin because they live very far away. Even though now with the pandemic, we have this advantage of Zoom in which we can call people from all over the world. Like now you are in US, I'm here in Australia. So that's is something that before we couldn't do easily. There is another aspect that I found very important is the symbolic presence of the family of origin and children in the session, which means even though there are only two chairs with two people in the room, you can add other chairs in the room metaphorically and physically, the chair of family of origin, the chair of the children, and you can ask questions to them as their children or their mother or father were present in the session. So with the language, you can say, if your child will be here, how he or she will describe your problem as a couple? What they think do we need to transform something in the family? So this is a kind of question, or you can ask to a very relevant, intrusive, powerful mother or one of the two, and you can ask as she was present. Now, how was your child when he was little? How did you feel he capable to move on and to feel really independent from you, from the family? which also focus on one issue that Donald Williams has been describing very well, the process of intergenerational intimidation. What does it mean that many people in their 40s, even 50s, they don't feel that they are adult in relationship to their own parents. They feel they are still children of their parents. They have a sense of uh, intimidation, like they feel that they cannot speak out in front of their parent. And that is very painful and sometimes it's very dangerous for the life of the couple. So we try to increase the level of self-esteem of each of the two members of the couple 
you know that the day will be able to feel more a work in themselves. So we work on the horizontal level of the couple. Basically, we look for three, for three elements. How much they are present, how much they are lost. Trust, respect, and intimacy. These are three elements that we found very relevant. And generally, when trust is gone, or respect is gone, it's very hard that people will have a good intimacy or good sex life. So we have to restore trust among two partners, then to trust each other anymore. So this is a kind of exploration in what we call the multi-generational family approach. Multi-generational means having a frame that is larger than the cup for themselves and to be able to work with different aspects of the family. I remember there was a couple with a, an Italian doctor, very powerful in the hospital, totally frozen in the house. And he was the son of a widow. She had been raising him and the sister by a son, father immigrated in Germany. They were sending some money, but basically the mother was a hero for these children. So this man grew up with his hero mother. Uh, when he grew up, he was still so dependent from her. Just to give you an example, she had a fever, she would call him and he said, son, you have to come because I feel sick. And the son would say, but you have your GP. She was living in a small country, countryside, in a small village in the country. And they couldn't um, say no to the mother. So he has to run any time to look at the mother. Of course, the wife was really fed up with all of them. She felt betrayed by this man because he was so much concentrated on the mother that was really unavailable for her. So our work was working on the couple, but also was working with this complication. So once finally the man was able to go to visit the mother and say, mom, you are old, you have some physical issues, your doctor is good, he will take care of you. I, take, I have to take care of my life, I have to take care of my marriage and my own family. And you have to understand that. So what I found that this kind of codependency has to be broken by the younger generation, which means in this case, this man. It's very hard for the older generation to, to start the process. But I found that for the sake of their children or their grandchildren, they can make this transformation. They can accept in this case that this man could feel freer. Now, I would like now to uh, show you a short video, which in a way captures some of my ideas about, about what I said so far, in a way which is fun, is creative, and will uh, maybe remain in, in your memory much more than my words, or much more if I show you a PowerPoint. This is Jill and this is Rob. It's a couple of their 40s, middle age. They have two young children and they are coming to therapy because they have big conflict in their relationship. They might even think about divorcing soon. I would like to show to you today a way or working with couples, couple in crisis, that is a little bit different from the usual one. Normally, therapists, when a couple asks for help, they start to do couple therapy. 
I don't believe much to work with the two members of the couple alone. So I develop a model of working with couples that we call intergenerational couple therapy. And I will explain to you briefly what I mean. Let's start first with the assessment. Assessment of couple functioning. Which are the main ingredients to look at when a couple is in crisis? First level is horizontal, which means we want to explore the relationship between Jill and Rob. What we want to look for? Something that we can call the weakness, the weakness of the couple. What does it mean? How much they are a we. Often couples are never a we. It's either me or you. Or me against you. Or me in contrast with you. So the main point that we need to explore at this level, I will uh, synthesize in three points. Respect, trust, intimacy. They are the three main ingredients that make a couple feel alive. Respect. When a couple is passing through great difficulty in their relationship, the first thing that is gone, respect. What does it mean? No one of the two who want to listen to the other one. Each of them might feel I know what I want. Trust. Trust is, is going out of the couple as well as respect. Because trust means I really know how to put myself in your shoes. How to look at your reality from another perspective. And of course, with the lack of respect and trust, also the intimacy, sex life, intimate level, tenderness in the couple is very difficult. And many people come to therapy saying, you know, we don't have any sex life anymore. We don't have any moment that we spend together. This is more or less the first level, the horizontal one. Then we move to the other level, which is intergeneration. Intergenerational means how Jill deal with their own family of origin. How Rob has been able to dialogue with his own family. So we want to check different level of differentiation, which means how much either Jill or Rob has been maturing, has been growing in their own family. How much they gain what Bowen will call a high position, which means I can stand in front of my parents. I don't feel to be a child anymore. Another very important aspect is the level of belonging and separation, which means when one of the two is over dependent from the family of origin, is not free, is suffocated by this family. Many problems in the couple appear because one mother or one father or one or the other is more important than the partner. Another possibility is cut off, which means how much one person feel that his distance is, is not in touch anymore with his or her own family of origin. Cut off also is similar to run away, meaning that one person, after the man, run away from the family. He may be left the family very young. He was not feeling cared for. So he cut all the connection with the past. Another very important level to explore is the social level. What does it mean, social level? When a couple is alive, has fun, 
as intimacy, as a solid relationship, they always have and share friends. When the couple is not alive anymore, the friends also are gone. Or she has her own friends, he has his own friends. So it's like two separate worlds. Then, because today we have most of the couples in double careers, we have many hours that Jill or Rob spend every day with people at work. So the, to explore the work environment, the connection through work are also very important resources, as well as community reality, especially when, as often happened today, that you have mixed couples, couples that can belong to different culture and ethnic groups. And this is also important that each of them, or the two, will feel that their own cultural traditional values are respected and welcome in the couple. I would like to describe the different stage of couple therapy using just Rob and Jill as a good example. The first problem is about motivation. Because when we receive a couple, they generally don't really agree on coming together. Generally, it's the wife that is more motivated, the husband follow, sometimes is in disagreement, even about the idea of going to a, an expert to do couple therapy or my, my not be available, or my just accompany the spouse. So how you can build the shared motivation between uh, Jill and Rob? Then you had to, in order to do that, you had to be able to look at the family structure. At one level, the children, which are the most precious things that they have together. And they, as we'll see later, they will be a very good resource. But we have to start with their own family history. The wife might be having a very idolized father. And this father might be very much in the middle of the couple. Or she might have aunt, she might have a, a sick mother and she has been over involved in the care of the mother. So in many ways, Jane might be a very much over dependent person. She has never been really able to define her own boundaries to feel really free in itself. The man, Rob, might be have a very big distance from his own family of origin. He may have left house when he was young because of the divorce between the parents or because of feeling not welcome or feeling competition with the father or with the sibling. So in a way, Rob has been running away from his own belonging. So this is a match, eh, an encounter between an overdepending wife and the runaway man. And sometimes this creates a very dysfunctional kind of connection. So by entering their family history, and by trying to feel what both of them are missing, then the motivation might be reached because they may understand that in order to make the couple function better, they have to do some work upstairs with their own belongings, their own families. And this is what it means to do an intergenerational couple therapy. Then, when to invite physically family of origin or children in the session, it's very important to be able to 
to understand when is the good moment. The good moment is when both of them trust therapists and trust themselves in this therapeutic space. It's easier to invite the children because generally parents feel that the children are what they have the best. So we can ask them, bring the children once. They can come as my consultant. So then children comes and they will bring a lot of aliveness. You can understand many things about how they've been played the role of mother and father with them. If they start to feel a team as parents, this is a good beginning to think about be a good team as spouses. Then, at a later time, you might decide to ask to Jill, what about inviting your parents to a session? Can you call them and ask for help? Or you can even invite the children to help mother to do that. So she might start to think that could be a good idea to have them coming. If the parents will come in the session, you will feel what is missing Jill, what is confusing Jill. What does it mean to idolize so much the father? If it's a way to feel very little, how she can get rid of this sense of be very little because the father is so big. And also to make her to feel that she can change something in the relationship with the mother. The mother might be not only just a sick person, but can be a person that can bring wisdom and understanding to the daughter. It's more difficult to engage Rob with the families because Rob has been cut off from the family for a long time. But you can make present the people that are so distant by creating their presence in the session. You can ask to him, what you will do if your father will be here? If I ask to your father about you when you are a child, what you will tell me? So in a way you create this presence. Or oh, sometime I ask to father, try to make as you call him, what you will ask to your father to ask for help. Many, many times these people like Rob might feel very embarrassed to ask for help. But at the same time, they may feel, start to think that could be a good idea to reconnect. So this is the whole idea about introducing regeneration in the room. And, of course, after you have been passing through that process, you want to see what to do with them as two individuals that are together. So if they have been lacking, as we said before, of trust, intimacy and respect, you want to restore that in order that they would reach a better we. We are together. You, in order to get to this point, you have to give words and space to their sorrow, to their suffering, to what they feel they didn't get when they were children in their own families, to their losses, to their disconnection. So all this stuff has to be part of the therapy. Then, of course, people might pass through a depressive stage because they might touch themselves and feel, who am I? Something is missing on me. And then they can start to feel support each other in this process of renovation, in this process of growing. Of course, in order to do that, you have to move from mutual protection to be more authentic. Many couples suffer a great deal because for years they never tell, told them what they feel about each other they be hiding behind the mask. If they take off the mask, 
they will be more fragile but more real and they will gain more interest in each other. Therefore, the final goal of therapy is to transform their blockages, their distance, to recreate a very good bond among them. It's almost like to help them to remarry. Sometimes we really build up in the session a sort of ritual of remarriage in which they might feel that through this ritual they can really present a different aspect of themselves. So the, that is a very good handing, but it's also very good handy if they realized that there is no any more love, no interest in each other. But they have been passing through such a, a process in which they don't retaliate one against the other. They don't fight one against the other. They can separate in a very dignified way. And this will be bene beneficial for the children. Because often when parents split, when one win, one lose, or they split in a big, with big anger, the children will be put in the middle. So the idea is how to help them to restore their parental role, even if they split as a couple. The description of Jill and Rob is the description of a couple that was aware of their difficulties and in a way or another they were coming for help because they felt that their relationship needed to be worked out, needed some help. There are many other situations in which couples are not ready to ask for help for themselves. So what happened? In my profession, I saw many, many situations where a child, one child, will perform some symptoms and parents come because of the symptom of the child. But in reality, this is only the presenting problem because either parents and the child too, they know that the real target, the very vulnerable part of the family is the couple. So the therapist can accept to work with the child problem. But at the very end, this is a camouflage couple therapy. Many, many, many of the requests for therapy for medium, not too serious, but psychosomatic relational disorder in children are very much an indirect way to ask for help for the couple. Because as we know, the couple in this description of three generational story family is always the most vulnerable part. So children can really help parents through their problems to reconsider their couple difficulties and by having the child as the bridge, the occasion, they can come and indirectly we can help them to transform their marital relationship. So we reach the same goal. And we have to thank our little child for the symptom that he has been performing. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this short video, which in itself has been capturing some of my ideas, the one that I've been already presenting to you. Um, there is one thing at the end of this video that was called camouflage couple therapy. And I would like to expand a little bit this idea. Now, I'm a child psychiatrist and I've been seeing 
so many children in my life coming to me for a number of issues, psychosomatic disorder, behavioral problem, learning problem, uh, school problem, uh, any kind of problem. Then by working with the, with the family frame, not just working with the child in solitude, but looking at the relational component of the child problem, I found that the majority of these issues in a way are a very relevant signal for family stress, signal about discomfort based on either couple, parents' uh, issues, or even unfinished business with the family of origin. So what I try to do, I not try to fix the problem, instead I try to be accompanied by the problem inside the family. Like for example, recently with the child that was brought to me because he had big episode of anger and rage with the father and they didn't know how to control him. And they were having difficulties also among themselves as a couple. What I did, I tried to uh, look for where the anger was coming from in this family. So I asked the help of this boy, say, you know, you can help me to draw and also to look into your family genogram to see where the anger comes from. Uh, interesting that we have been here in the history of each of the parents and the family was a Jewish family and they were hiding during the Second World War in a, in a, in a village outside their country for a long time, as you know. So they came out from this experience with a lot of sadness, with a lot of anger. And both of them, sadness and anger, has been transmitted to the next generation and then to the young children. So it was so beautiful to see how they start to decide to draw together, starting for the child, we start to draw the anger, and the, the, he draw a volcano in an action. And interestingly enough, the father, when he was his turn, he was drawing himself another volcano. So there were two different volcanoes in an action. And then the boy describes sadness as a nice block. So the fantastic metaphor. So do you see through the anger of this boy, we move to the anger of the father, and then to the anger and sadness that were coming from both family of origin because of the terrible trauma that they've been living through. So this I will call a bottom-up approach, which means starting from a child problem, moving up to the couple, and moving from the couple to the family of origin of each of them. I found that this, this exploration is very healing, is very useful. Now, uh, often marriage get deteriorated because you have a third person in between. One of these third person is often a lover, which means extramarital affair from one side or both sides, which is a big wound in the intimacy and the, the respect and the trust in the couple. But you can do a lot of work also with betrayal because somehow this is an experience that creates a big trauma. But if the couple feel like a unit, they can overcome that trauma that of course require a lot of transformation in the way in which each of them uh, uh, play their role in the family. There is another third entity which I call the children. What does it mean? For many couples when they got children 
what happened was that the love moved from the love in the couple to love and passion of a mother for his own children. And what happened with them? That the man doesn't feel to be a priority anymore. And a newcomer is always contested him, making also create a lot of problem if the couple is not able to transform themselves. Is the mother who give all his love, her love to the child and forget about the partner, the partner sooner or later feel excluded. Or if the man feel excluded and then maybe has a lover because the mother is occupied with the children, then this of course brings another very very big difficulty in the in the couple relationship. But still, you can work with this third entity as well. As much as you look for resources, you do not dare just to blame the couple. Then, as I already told before, the in-laws can be another big obstacle, another big third entity in between the partner. And the in-laws are always present when there is too much dependency for one of the partner in relationship to her own family of origin. So these are some of the configuration that we have when we work with couple. Then we describe also the step-by-step -step process of couple therapy. So we don't invite children or parents too soon because the couple has to develop a sense of trust in themselves and with the access therapist in order to take bigger risk. One of the reasons for which many couple therapy don't, don't handle very well is when there is no shared motivation among the two partners. What does it mean? One partner look for therapy and uh, push the other one to accept or invite the other one, like a guest, to come uh, to therapy. Now, if the motivation is coming only from one, there will be very little hope of good success. So what's the job of the therapy at the beginning of the, uh, of the encounters with the couple? To create space for mutual motivation. Sometimes one of the two parties comes in say i want to i don't want to split but only because of the children you know, i want to save the mother because of the children the other one might come and say i want to work on our issues as a couple so then you have to reach a point which they have some agreement on what to do in couple therapy and by listening to the reason of each of them, sooner or later, you can find some common ground. And also to feel there is not much pressure from one side, and the other one is just coming to please the person. As we know, often women are more available to go to therapy for their children, also when they feel there is a problem in their family or in the couple. Men sometimes are more resistant. They don't believe in psychology, they don't believe in this kind of thing. But at the very end, if they come, it's up to us how to motivate men to be involved. We found that for many men, a very important door to motivate them is by looking at their family genogram as how they've been growing their own families. And you will find how much many men has been missing, especially fathers, relevant figure in the family. They felt in a way either neglected or they ran away soon from the family. So they don't have a sense of belonging. So you can help them to go back to their history and to, to explore some of the reasons for which there was this unfinished business in the family. 
Another very important element that motivate father are their children. So maybe they might feel that for the children they can take bigger risk. You know? Then of course you have to deal with the male code. The male code uh, has been described by many, many others in terms of how certain behaviors of men repeat through generation. If you think about the grandparents or, or grand grandparents or some time ago, so father were never oppressive, were very authoritative. And uh, so kids never had a friendly relationship with their fathers. And so they never learn how to expose themselves on the level of feelings. Women in that sense are much more equipped. If they are depressed, for example, in the marriage, they go out, they meet their friend, they talk. Men don't talk. Even if they're male friend, they go there to maybe to do sport, to do some physical activity, but they don't talk about themselves. So I think therapy is also an educational uh, place where we can help people to talk more about their feelings. And this will be much more beneficial for the couple. If the man are able to say what he feels and is not does a show inside outside. Now Davis Nash, who unfortunately died just recently has been working extensively with couples and what he said is very relevant that one of the reasons for, the, for which the couples suffer or they might end in divorce is because for a long time, for years, they didn't tell what they really feel and what they really think about the relationship. It's almost like they play facade and they don't take the risk to take out what has been really their suffering, their disillusions, their, you know, what they miss. And mostly that happens for the fear of separation. So the fear of separation sometimes is a paradox because you might well separate because of the fear of separation. Because at the very end, one of the two will be fed up and want to have a more authentic relationship. Or neither one want that, so in that case, this marriage is almost dead, you know? So in a way, what's the role of the therapist in all that? I think, first of all, one important element in not to take side, which is, theoretically speaking, is very easy. In practice, it's not so easy. Imagine that the therapist has been passing through a very heavy separation in itself or herself. And you have a couple that split or is going to split. And maybe one of the two is too much intrusive or powerful. The other one is more passive and has to play the role of the victim. So therapists can respond with these emotions by taking side. So taking side can be very dangerous for a good uh, result of couple therapy. And sometimes people take side because they still have some open issues themselves. I'm talking about the therapist. And this also brings to another very important element, which is the personal training of family and couple therapists. I found that through the years, the attention to the personal formation, to the personal training or therapy has been decreasing. It's almost like people look for strategy, techniques, brief focus therapy, you know, without taking up consideration of how important it is to go in depth with couple issues and we are able to go in depth with these issues only in one condition, that we feel complete in ourselves, that we feel that we are not going to project our own unfinished difficulties. And couple is a territory 
where very easily we can confuse us with them, our own personal experience with their own personal experience. Now, we don't have to be perfect to be a therapist, but we have to be aware of which are our limits or which are areas in which we are still very confused about ourselves. Therefore, supervision, uh, personal work is very relevant for that. I would like to say a last thing, which is the use of genogram. I found that the use of genogram is fantastic, either in family therapy as well as in couple therapy. And the family genogram, a drawing, the family genogram with the couple, is a fantastic way to engage them and also to look at the different components of the family, you know, because the family genogram is a graphic that take consideration at least three generations. So you have to enlarge the picture. And then you make them themselves to understand that something that they call marital issue might be connected with the uh, with their history, with their development in their own families. I think it's time to me to, to end. I would like just to mention that this video that you've been watching is part of the Academia Multimedia Library. The Academia is my institution in Rome. And you can go through Vimeo to have a best time and you can get a number of videos, lectures, a clinical video that we've been producing through the years. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and insights on this important topic, Dr. Andolfi. I want to thank our sponsors of the series, CPA and Associates. I hope that you all have enjoyed our session. And if you're interested in, in the next three sessions in this series, do not forget to RSVP at aamft.org slash at home. Next week's session will feature Lena Wang, in an informative hour on managing the grant writing process to obtain funding for your projects. As a reminder, if you are completing this session for CE credit, please follow the instructions in the email you were sent today to complete your session evaluation and download your CE certificate. Thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Goodbye.